SOC analysts are unsung heroes. The SOC Analyst Appreciation Day Awards program recognizes analysts who go above and beyond the call of duty and handle their pressure-packed jobs exceptionally well. SOC leaders nominate your top performing team members to show them just how much you appreciate everything they do to thwart cybercrime. Diva will award analysts during this year's SOC Analyst Appreciation Day events on October 19th. You have until September 6th to get your nominations in. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Devo to learn more. Every hack follows the same pattern. First, hackers exploit a human error, like a leaked key or a secret left in code. They gain a foothold and then pivot, moving from one compromised system to the next. Teleport breaks this cycle. Open source Teleport gives every engineer, every piece of hardware, every application an identity, replacing secrets like passwords and keys with auto-expiring identity-based certificates. Learn why most visionary businesses in the world choose Teleport at securityweekly.com forward slash Teleport. And welcome back for the news. But first, do you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover on one of our shows? Give us a submission for your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests and completing the form. Uh, we review all these suggestions monthly and we'll reach out to you once they're re re reviewed. Uh, also, don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings at securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. And with that, it's time for the news, but we've added two new guests in addition to Dr. Doug and just Joshua Marpet to the show. First up, Mr. Lee Neely. Hey, it's good to be here. Although I was wondering if I can't concentrate, can I get a job at a canned juice factory? <laughs> oh. oh. No, see, you'd have to work <laughs> at a mirror factory because that's a job you could see yourself doing. Uh, it'd be a bad reflection on me. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, uh, all right. Sorry. Oh, dear. It's been dear. a day. It, it has. A nice, sh nice shirt. I, Thank wait. you. Josh sent me a memo. <laughs> he, he did. He did. <laughs> and also joining us via the powers of the internet, Mr. Chris Blask. Hello, hello, hello. How's life? It It's life. That's for sure. Right. I, I will say I'm uh, I'm honored to be, have Chris on the show because uh, I follow his uh, adventures vicariously through Facebook and uh, have for quite some time, and uh, I'm very jealous. And you know, love to hear all the the stories and the ongoings with uh, traversing life on a boat. Well, uh, he, as you know from Facebook, I'm happy to talk about Sam Clemens here and Mark Twain. I've actually been doing speed tests, so we're going to do a propulsion test with uh, local law enforcement next week. Oh, so what are they going to get the radar gun? And it actually is a quarter mile. You have, <laughs> you have to go there and back in ten minutes. Oh, I thought he meant he was oh, going to wow. run from the police. <laughs> <laughs> not, not. I was like, oh, you're going to do a propulsion test with local law enforcement. That's what I call it. Uh, I, I had visions of him trying to eject them and see how far they'd fly. <laughs> clearly it's wrong an vision. Yeah. Uh, well, Chris, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. We've got a, a ton of fun stuff in the uh, the news this week. Uh, obviously, Paul's not with us this week, and Paul usually dumps a ton of news stories uh, with us here. Mm -hmm. uh, and Chris, I don't know if you got the the link that some of the news stories we've got in here um, at uh, security, securityweekly.com forward slash PSW752. Also for our listeners. Well, I, I noticed... Larry, you let off with two Starlink articles or the same article twice. Yeah, it was the same article twice, and it actually wasn't the one that I was looking for. <laughs> uh, no. either, either one of them, uh, because I read an article uh, with Mr. Wooters uh, before DEF CON, which very much went in-depth into uh, the attack with this $25 device um, to allow it effectively to to get root access, to allow it to boot an alternate operating system, uh, and so forth. Um, to me, it was very reminiscent of the old um, original Xbox uh, mod chip stuff, yeah. in which you were mm -hmm. grounding out some of the pins to yep. bypass specific portions of components on the board to replace them effectively with your own to hijack that path. And was very similar to some of the types of things that they were doing with the Starlink stuff by effectively disabling some of the onboard components so they could replace it with their own. Right. Um, with a board populated with their own chips that were readily available and uh, custom one-off boards, as it were, for some of the, uh, the the PC board manufacturers, like dirty PCBs and those types of flakes. And that 
twenty-five dollars worth of gear, you could uh, you know effectively uh, root your uh, Starlink device and run your own stuff on it if you wanted. So hmm. I mean, Chris, you've got Starlink, right? Right. Yeah, I got it a little less than a week ago. We were trying to trying to write before this, and it seems a little spotty at the moment. But yeah, you know, this this was Starlink, but now I'm on five G. Would you use a mod chip on your Starlink and try to effectively root it so you could run your, as, as Larry put, run your own code on it? Well, no, right? You know, so it's funny. Elizabeth Kaufman was my boss back in the PIX days, the turn of the century, right? And we were, you know, talking about Starlink uh, on Facebook just, just the other day, right? You know, what this is, is a PIX. It's a single quantum unit of internet connectivity. And if you want to hack it, you're really not the customer. You know, what Starlink is what Musk and Star and, and SpaceX are trying to do with Starlink is spam enough market share. You think about it, you know, these the, the satellites are putting up do not have long long lifespans. How much, you know, and you look at this, the kind of clock cycles they like to run in, in development. Do you kind of expect these things? You know, but the generations will will rapidly iterate and the terminals and other things will get will get better in various ways, uh, more secure, uh, hopefully. But, but, but again, that's not that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for volume right now, and you know, it seems to be they might be right. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how long do those satellites last? I don't even know. A couple of years tops, right? You know, the, it's, uh, really? it's high volume blow altitude. Yeah, these things are you know one to three hundred miles up. You know, they're dragging the atmosphere all the time, and they're the size of pizza boxes. But that, I mean, that's because of the technology. I mean, they they want they they realize that in a couple of years, three years, that that the technology is going to improve. So putting up a satellite designed to last for 30 years is just pointless because it's going to be obsoleted in a couple of years. Right. You look where this is going, right? You know, so Barb Stinnett is the co-CEO at, uh, at Starlink and she's also the CEO of uh, Orbit's Edge. You look into that and they're just flying the same thing, but server racks. Huh. So think about that, you know, re- you know, reasonable lifetime to monetize, you know, to be, to be worth putting them up there, you know, for launch costs, but you know, servers in the cloud, the LIDAR connections between the Starlink satellites, and just you know, rapid re- rapid replenishment of the of the constellations, so you know, technology can catch up. Hmm. Interesting. Well, well, I think they were also gambling on that they would have better means to put stuff up there, you know, going forward. That that was going to get cheaper and cheaper. So why build for you know ten years out when probably in two years we can go put new ones up that'll be faster and better and and whatnot. And I mean. That just made that it makes sense. I mean, if you think an old school, like you know, it's going to cost millions and millions and millions of dollars to get something off the ground. But I think they're sort of gambling on that they'll have better ways to do that. Thinking and it just just serendipitously, I ended up talking to, to I met Barb Center when I was working in Unisys. We had a conversation about this, and at that time, I you know started building these boats in Boca Chica Channel, while her and elon musk are building all that stuff in boca chica texas but it's it's the same sort of thing you know and these are the you know shoot me for cliche words these are rapid innovation cycles we all sort of live in right you know you can't Mm -hmm. sit there and say okay i'm going to engineer this thing perfectly before i start because by then you know the world's moved on yeah Yeah. and and chris that reminds me very much of how sort of your evolution uh between the two boats have have gone for you from what i've observed that it's it's a rapid you know, rapid evolution of what works and what doesn't. And I think it's awesome to see. It's a great practical lesson, I think. Well, you know, what leads to actually you know, having me here in my, my post, you know, it's, I'm not, you know, I'm not surprised at all, you know, to have the sociopolitical, you know, uh, factors in a local environment lead to law enforcement demanding that I prove certain you know, capabilities. So, you know, I'm not actively looking to instigate that. I'm going about doing my things, but as that happens, that's great. Okay, good. So, you know, when Josh uh, pinged me, I'm literally, I've got Sam Clemens and I'm doing little, you know, speed runs with different combinations, you know, the first combination of motors and batteries. So I'll play with that for a couple of days. I need to know that anyways. You know, what is the compliant figure- con- configuration? I will know. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I could have pl- pre-planned all that in advance, but there's a million other things that need to be done. So <laughs> do some of them and move forward. Yep. You could have, and you could have pre-planned it in advance and, you know, the pre-planning and the execution could have taken two years. As opposed to, hey, let's just go try it, and you get it done in three days. Right, we're hackers. I mean, that's, that's literally the definition of all this. You know, I, I, it's funny. Earlier in my career, people would say, "You must have been a hacker when you were a kid." And I kind of said, "No." I mean, it wasn't really. You know, I, I got an Apple II C you know, for no particular reason in my early twenties. But um, looking back at it, the answer was yes. 
You know, you just look at the process. You look at the policies. Why is nobody walking over there? If I stand over there, does anything happen? Right? Jump on that board <laughs> of hacking by definition. You're not saying I'm coming in here with a team of five thousand and we're going to plan the new city. You're saying, oh, look, a city. I wonder how that works. Right? Poke at it. Find out. Yeah, Lee, you had a comment in there. Oh, I was thinking about one of the things that short life satellite is avoiding is uh, the need for. Uh, Upgrades that just won't work on the running hardware. Yeah. I remember a few years ago, talking to a gentleman from JPL, and they had the, they had decided that all somebody had decided all the satellites needed to uh, use encrypted communications, and they pretty much had enough CPU to do what they were doing, and they weren't so sure that they could actually retrofit the running birds. So now, try and deliver high speed internet with enough overhead for future up future proof without breaking the bank on every one. Uh, I think short lives a good idea. I, I would agree. But uh, Chris, you bring up some uh, some interesting points about, you know, hey, you know, we, great, this researcher hacked the Starlink uh, terminal, the 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 end, um, so that now they can potentially use it to explore network and remove some of the restrictions and so forth. And it was easy and cheap to do so. But it's kind of Starlink's model to, you know, cheap, fast, deploy hundreds of thousands of these things, and we'll figure it out later uh, after we've built market share and all that type of stuff. And I think that's a that's a fascinating sort of... Uh, well, you know, they weren't the that. first. I mean, uh, do you remember uh, Facebook Loon? Like the bird, Loon? Uh, oh. They were going to use long-life, very small ultralight planes. Uh, not not very small, sorry, actually very large for, for wingspan. But they were going to use solar-powered planes that would store power on a battery and literally just fly for months and years and provide worldwide oh, internet yeah. via those. Uh, th this idea of providing worldwide internet via uh, near-Earth uh, communications is not new. Uh, Musk is the first one, and, and you know Starlink is the first one that was just able to do it. Who was doing balloons? Somebody was oh, going to do God. balloons. That was the Germans. <laughs> No. Yeah, somebody was doing balloons. Somebody that might have been Facebook, actually. I, I don't remember. Somebody was doing the planes. Somebody was doing balloons. Musk was going after it with satellites. There was a whole slew of plans on how to do this, and uh, you know, Starlink actually worked. Everybody else just sold off those business units and divested. Yeah, well, you think about that. There's still like HughesNet that's still out there, and those were not cheap satellites, and you know, different approach that they, they cost them lots of money to put. You know, geostationary satellites up there, and and all that type of stuff, and they took years to plan that development, and mm -hmm. it sucks. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's better than some of the alternatives. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I do think that's the problem, though. I mean, we're we're sort of getting at that, you know, rapid prototyping models versus long time waterfall model development, like like NASA. There was a st I put a story in there this week on NASA. How they're they're yeah. you know they're wanting to redesign uh, high performance space flight computing chips because they don't think they have enough computing capability to do some of the things they want to mm. do and their process is quite long, you know they're saying they want to put a reactor on the moon by 2030. Um, that's a long process, you know, to get that done through NASA. So they're they're the opposite of the rapid prototyping bunch. But now mm. they're saying these computers we designed in the 60s might need to be upgraded a little bit. I don't think they were still using them. <laughs> then again, who knows? Then they, again, they might be. Th then again, you talk about that long that long lead. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. All their engineers came out of that old ICS type stuff. It's like if you don't build it the last sixty years, don't build it. You know, it's it's like they're not worth the investment, and they just didn't have that kind of concept of wow, this technology will all be obsolete next week. Yep. Mm. yep. Or yeah, we might need encryption one day. <laughs> Well, I mean, well, it has, go ahead, go there has to be structure to it, right? You know, you know, innovation without structure. We went through this sort of process. I think maybe we're done with it. You know, corporate America said, hey, we're going to have innovation. We're going to hire innovative people and not tell them what to do. And uh, no, you know, you have to, in the same way we're talking about, you, there is, you know, long-term plans. I'm hoping to see Artemis, you know, launch from the boats here in a, in, uh, in a week or two. And we, you know, NASA, you know, we need to get to the moon and maybe that's long-term planning. But if you look, you look at inevitabilities coming ahead, you know, you know I love this whole inev inevitability curve idea. And in the last decade, I've just spent a lot of time on these long-term strategies. So, you know, when you talk about balloons, 
I mean, Fred Coleman and I, you know, I guess three years ago, put together this 25 year plan for Columbia. You can look at the next couple of years for sure. And in up to seven years, you know, you know, that's, you can see that pretty, pretty clearly seven to 15 years and 15 to 25 years. But along that way, you have perhaps balloons, you know, mountainous region. You know, I have a, a, a you know, natural disaster in a mountainous area. I can pop a balloon or a couple of them and have high speed, you know, communications running in no time. So things like that are inevitable. Now that's beyond the seven year uh, horizon in that case, but you can see that something like that. So Starlink mm-hmm. and these things are going to happen. So those things, if they're going to happen, they fundamentally change things. And that's what, you know, like, how is it that I knew that we bring on Chris and we're going to talk news for 10 seconds and all of a sudden it's going to be a talk about futurism and where the world is going and uh, strategy of the technology world and everything else. And I love it. Don't get me wrong. But I knew it was going to freaking happen. Well, you know, somebody, somebody, somebody mentioned earlier, you know, when Stuxnet happened, you know, this uh, uh, La Presse, French La Presse uh, journalist called me. It was literally, you know, everybody at the time, you understand, they're journalists. But he was overtly saying, look, isn't America, you know, living in a glass house throwing stones? And I'm saying, look, you know, it's 2010. You know, anyone hasn't seen this sort of thing coming for a long time, you know, is not paying attention. You know, I think nation states are fully aware that industrial control systems are hackable and, you know, have assets behind them. And this is just an example. You know, this news item, to our point here, is an example of where we are along these lines. You know, it's interesting by itself. However, what does it mean? So, to transition a little bit, um, sort of on the converse side of this, on the on the opposite side of this, um, I had a story, um, and and forgive me for the source. I know it, this particular person can be polarizing and not. Um, but I think the arguments were very valid and were very sort of succinct um, from Cory Doctorow uh, sort of summing up some of the the stuff about uh, sick codes um, hacking John Deere's um, uh, tractor interface uh, at DEF CON. Oh, this, is, this is a big fucking story, man. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. This is a big fucking story. Because this is relevant to every single piece of equipment that you buy. I mean, Larry, how much equipment do you buy in a year? Uh, don't include the stuff you don't tell your wife about. Uh, you know, ten to twenty thousand dollars worth of you know computer gear, easy. Every year. Every year. Every year. Now, okay, so we're a little weird. Yeah. But still, anybody in the world, anybody in the U.S. buys something every year: a new laptop, a new stove, a new refrigerator, a new whatever, right? Yep. And uh, a new TV, a new tablet, a new blah, 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 blah. And this is part of like literally saving the world in that if you make them repairable, you don't throw them the fuck away. Yep. And, and some of the other ones, too, that I think that w- was very interesting in that um, John Deere is probably one of the, the biggest companies that I'm aware of that are very much against right to repair. Like they want to lock up their tractors and their combines and all this type of stuff between behind software licensing saying that the the farmers that are spending a hundred two hundred three hundred you know million dollars on this combine tractor thing don't mm-hmm. actually own it because when something breaks uh you got to go and unlock the software and you got to pay the technician to come out and it might be three weeks before they get there you just can't go and boop boop, boop and or replace this part because there has to be some interaction because they're only licensing the software and they don't own it. And that's, no, you don't have the right to repair. That's the model for that car companies are going to too. I hope not. Oh, well, they are. I, I saw I, I, I saw yeah. a story the other day about how they'd done this upgrade and it was suddenly a mandatory fifteen hundred dollar charge because the car wouldn't actually work without the upgrade. Yep. But you had to unlock these other features yep. that were now mandatory features. But when you bought the car, they weren't yeah, mandatory yeah, features, we t- and you could opt out. And then all of a sudden, they're like, "Well, yeah, but if you want your car to continue to operate, you're going to have to purchase yep. this we additional were, license." Yeah, we were talking about this last week about some battery replacements. And, and all that I mean, the stuff. more your car is just software dependent, the more they'll be able to do that because mm-hmm. when you get to the point where the car just simply won't operate without the software they're going to you know they've got you and they go okay you just spent all this money on a car and they're going to call you and go well you need to upgrade your car because this other one is insecure and unfortunately we're no longer going to be running windows nt for tesla uh we're, we're going to you know we need you to switch to to something else well it's, it's well, so worse you, than you, that. You, go ahead you, you, I mean, yeah so you call me in here you know for policy hacking so let, you know we're hackers let's hack these policies and let's think about it, right? You know, so pick on, you know, let's pick John Deere, right? You know, so this company is, you know, is going, you know, going this way because of some reason, you know, that makes sense to them and is because they want to be evil overlords or because they don't want to go, go out of business. 
uh, Chris, and so whatever Chris, it is. Chris, I'm going to inject real quick there. I, I think, and based on some of Corey's comments there, um, that John Deere thinks that they are doing the best thing to lock everyone out of these things so that they can protect the world's food sources. <laughs> right. Yeah, and, well, it, it may be whatever the reason whatever is. Whatever the reason. Right. Again, our job as hackers, you know, company by company, because this is a thing. And this looks like, you know, intellectual property control concerns in threat intelligence sharing that I'm seeing in supply chain security sharing right now. We've been down this road before. You know, so you look at the motivations and maybe, you know, maybe, you know, we look at the policies and say there's no way we can change that. I don't think that's going to be ever the case. You know, maybe it's harder sometimes than others. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's always possible that, that they, by any definition, might be right. Um, I tend not to think so in this case either. But it's there's enough need for a change. The policies need to be changed. You know, hacking the actual code it, is, 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 again, perhaps a good demonstration. Maybe we can push some people to think. Sure. But we got to find out why they wanted to do this this way and either fix those problems or come up with another way. Yeah, no, and, and I think that very much comes down to the hacking the policy and you know, mm-hmm. hacking the company perspective and how, see if we can change how the company interacts with its customers by, by doing some of this stuff, Chris. I think you're absolutely right there. Um, I, I think this is a, it, it, and Josh, you're saying this is a really big deal. Like, if they're claiming that they're locking the owners, and I'm going to use air quotes there because of what John Deere said, the owners out of being able to repair um, some of their stuff and upgrade software and do all of these enhancements and replace parts and those types of things because they are believe that they are protecting the world's food supply and then something like this happens where you are now running doom on the John Deere tractor. Did, yeah. Didn't Vader say he was just protecting Alderaan from themselves? Yes, something yeah, like that. Something like, like that. Like, to me, this is not protection. They're, they've done completely oh, the opposite. Like, That's this corporate speak for we want to control this, but we're going to come up with a lame ass reason after the fact because we have to because it's bad press if we don't. We're protecting you from those evil hackers. Agreed. When in fact they're not with our limited security to protect the food supply. So yeah, it can blow back on you too, and you you claim you're all powerful and you'll take care of everybody, and then it turns out, oh yeah, here's some dude that's just going to run doom on this. <laughs> <laughs> But you yeah, know, I'll, I'll go on a limb, on a limb and, you know, just under my, under my name, you know, not anybody I represent and Understood. assume that whatever John Deere is saying is, you know, translates into we're afraid we'll go out of business, you know, lose control of IP or something like that. You know, there's some economic reason that that's usually the case. I mean, if they're really trying to save the world, then, you know, God bless them. But that's a unique case. What we'll mostly find, you know, is vendors that fear losing control of their IP, losing control of their supply chain, their revenue streams, because at the end of the day, you know, I like John Deere. They make a lot of stuff that I don't have to make myself. <laughs> we want to keep them in business. This is true. And GM and everybody else, right? But, you know, and this is, it really is, you know, I love the tech hacking. You know, it's still a wonderful thing, but it's all just the same. You know, it's why is that technology there? Why, you know, why are those laws there? You know, somebody's thinking something. Yeah. And, and, and Chris, I think, the brain. I, I think that there's some irony in that, that you talk about, you know, that maybe the one of the reasons why John Deere, and again, we're speculation and this is what we get to do because that's what we do. Um, we get to come up with some crazy ideas is that, you know, maybe John Deere is doing this because of some of that intellectual property stuff because they traditionally over time have said that, you know, farmers can't be trusted to modify and their, their repair their own stuff because they're going to make mistakes and, and, and so forth. Um, and they have documented many hundreds of, if not thousands of documented cases where uh, John Deere technicians have gone out to repair a tractor and gone, ah, oh, farmer, that thing that you welded on in that spot, that's amazing. And then they steal that and they implement it in the next line of tractors because it was an amazing invention that some guy in Indiana ne- had a need for. So he dug out his welder and a couple of pieces of mild steel and he did exactly what he needed him to. So I, I no. yeah. If when you think about the think about this company, this is John Deere, you know. And again, <laughs> lots of we use lots of examples, but we got this one right now. This is a you know beer and apple pie, a hundred and God knows how many years for sure. Generational employees in the last decade has gone from being you know not having a lot of software people to being mostly software people. You know, and moving you know may, uh, ten years may sound fast to the rest of us, but big organizations, you know, the momentum there is is phenomenal. So again, I would expect a lot of, you know, there's a lot of anxiety and concern anyways with that sort of change. And now we're supposed to share our, you know, this, all this code that we just spent all this money on hiring all these, you know, 
crazy young folks. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you put a company like that that's well, got that long tail and, or, and well, yeah, that doesn't work for them. If you want to lease it to me, that's fine. But don't sell it to me for full price. Tell me it's mine and then turn around and say, oh, yeah, you're really just leasing it. Lee, you had a comment in there? So I was thinking about, you know, what I've known from, you know, I'm now in a little more rural area than I used to be in the, the, you know, they they don't just have one of these tractors. They have four or five. And when harvest season's in, they're running them 24-7. They're, they're changing tires in the middle of the night, in the middle of, you know, in, in, in a rut in a field. They The guy welded something on to do something. He did probably didn't do it during the day. He probably did it at 2 a.m. because something wasn't working in the dark. Um, and, of course, these guys, these are really comfortable. They've got, you know, full climate control. It's like, it's a luxury item. And... These guys are fully capable of, of uh, repairing them and keeping them running around the clock and somebody telling them, no, you're not qualified to fix your tractor. That just, I can't imagine that going over well, let alone their, the other claims. It's just like, doesn't match the reality I see around here. Well, and, does anybody uh, here think that in 20 or 30 years, maybe 10 years, that there's going to be anybody in those climate controlled cabs at all? You know, the next couple of generations, you know, of those sort of fleets going to be fully automated. So maybe so at that in, point uh, in the 1700s and 1800s, 98 percent of America was farmers. Two percent was something else. Shopkeep, uh, blacksmith, whatever. Uh, World War One was 50 percent. Can I be a dandy? What's that? I, I want to be. World a... War... <laughs> yeah, World War One uh, was 50 percent when they invented 1920. Yeah. Yep. And now by it's... the 1950s, it was two percent working in the fields, farmers, right. and 90 percent doing other stuff. So complete role reversal, as it were. Exactly. Exactly. And, it's and, fascinating. Yeah, you know, and Chris, I'm not, I'm I'm there with you. I I think you're absolutely right. Um, given that you know many of the farmers that can purchase some of these high end pieces of equipment are largely automated as it is, mm -hmm. and that from my understanding, many of them are just sitting there in the cab to make sure that nothing goes wrong, which you could potentially monitor all of that remotely mm -hmm. with a whole bunch of cameras and such. You give it GPS coordinates and it goes and does its harvesting based on where it is and does everything for you. You're just sitting there basically watching the make sure that green light doesn't turn red. Well, I'd say that they're already pretty dang tech savvy. I mean, one of the, my neighbors used to have a big uh, almond orchard in uh, in Fresno, and he, you know you wouldn't have ex expect the amount of Wi-Fi and other I IoT, IoT technology. He is just like got cold and uh i mean hell i didn't know things like those drive lines or those rotating lines had gps in us for specific watering controls and a bunch of other there's a lot of technology already out there um i think chris i think you might be a little long on your timeline it might be more like five right yeah yep. yeah i think i think more like five i mean i could really see mm -hmm. that you well, it, it helps looking out forward, you know, you, you know, because 30 years isn't that long anyways. And that's ridiculous. No. Long. I, I agree. You know, I, you know, five might be pushing it, but it wouldn't surprise me in the least. I think in, in, in uh, fields that are easy to do that with, just like self-driving on highways is a lot easier than country roads. Right. But in fields that are easy, you know, monoculture, uh, uh, flat or straight fields, having tractors that are self-driving, not a big deal in five years, let's say. Having it on the hilly fields in, you know, the hilly farm fields in Vermont or terraced fields in Vietnam, you know, not so much. Mm, yeah, no. But, yeah, but I think I, I, what's fascinating to me is that you're right. You know, you've got these farmers that are fiercely independent and John Deere is telling them who they've been partnered with for generations. Because, you know, a, a little family farm doesn't buy a quarter million dollar combine with cash out of their back pocket. It takes them a long time to pay that off. All right. So the bank, John Deere, and the farmers have all been working together to make those things happen for literally generations. And now John Deere is going, oh, no, you don't actually own this. And no, you can't repair it. And you can't do it at three in the morning when normally you'd be working because you have to get this harvest in now. You've got 72 hours, 96 hours, whatever, to get this entire harvest in and make your year's money. And we won't have a tech out there for three weeks. Sorry. But the, you, know, you, you look at the economic advantages of, of tech in farming, right? You know, we all look, you know, re, we read these things. We have machines out there now that apply you know, fertilizer and water to specific plants. In, in enormous fields 
And that's not, you know, 10 years ago in Yemen, we were talking about this, you know, you know, that it was MIT at the time. Now that's in production, you know, 10 years forward, you're kind of expecting that to be built in. And, and change is hard. My, my grandmother was the youngest of nine sharecroppers uh, daughter in here in the in Florida. And like we say, that world is moving on. What does agriculture you know, and small farming look like, you know, 20 years and 40 years and six years in the, in the future? Good question. But, you know, spraying water randomly over a huge field is not going to be the thing. No. Well, especially out west where the fields don't, they don't have water anymore. Or they won't <laughs> in another, like, you know, six hours or so, whatever it is. Um, I mean, I, I think vertical. Uh, so, okay, so this is going a little far afield. Haha, <laughs> pun intended. But uh, wow. vertical farming is, I think, the way that we're going to be seeing it. There's actually experiments for doing underground vertical farming, uh, bringing the farms literally 50 feet underground, putting them in abandoned mines, things like that. And they're doing it. There's a warehouse in the Ironbound District of Newark, New Jersey, where they grow all the microgreens for like the restaurants for all of New York and Newark. Um, well, let's look at the inevitability driving this. You know, the, the population bomb was one of the boomer, you know, bookshelf uh, hits. And one of my earliest memories was Paul Ng on TV that you know the Earth could never ever feed more than 3.5 billion people, which is the population then. And we make 30 percent more food per person with 8 billion than we did then. And that's still with randomly spraying water around. You know, so the drivers, you know, our need to create food, you know, the economic, you know, cost uh, of creating food. There's so much to be gained. By you know using the tech you can easily foresee that's available now and where it's going to multiply you know production you know as you're saying Josh with less footprint with less energy with you know higher yields you know we're we're just you know, scratching the surface pun intended. Speaking of spraying water, <laughs> speaking of spraying water around. Oh God, Doug, tell us about your story number seven. Oh, hang on, let me see what my story. Number Hackers seven attack is. UK water supplier but extort the wrong company. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I saw that earlier. Okay. Yeah, this, like, this was this was Seriously? basically a, a story about the. And I I I read this several times trying to think about what it means, and so one one option is that that because they don't know where Birmingham is <laughs> in relation to London, they may have just thought, well, you know, it's almost the same place, right? I, I mean, you know, Stoke on Trent's pretty close to London. Not, but maybe if you're just somebody who can't use a map, uh, it could be that. My second theory was that they took the data from somebody who was vulnerable in the hopes that the other company wouldn't look too closely at the evidence and just go, oh my God, we're hacked, pay them, and and see that. Or they're just flat out stupid. <laughs> I mean... I, I mean, I, I, and that was my least likely theory, it seemed like to me, because it didn't make any sense Maybe I mean it. It really seemed to me like they they went after one uh, up up in Birmingham, and uh, and then they tried to use that against Tim's Water or Tim's River or whatever that company was called in order to get them to pay, and just hoping that it would look kind of similar to the same stuff that they have uh. and and see. But but yeah, I mean they basically went in there and they 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 compromised one company, and then they, they that Staffordshire is is the 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 county uh, up there. And then they use that data against a, a, a water supply company in London, which is nowhere near there, actually. <laughs> well, they have deeper pockets. Of course, I'm going to extort the other guys. I get more money back. Yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean, I agree. I mean, that was, that was sort of what I took on it was just they couldn't get into the one they really wanted. And, you know, you go to the Staffordshire Water Company and say, We're, we want you to pay a ransom. And they're like, how's 50 pounds sound? <laughs> you know. And, uh, <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I mean, you know, it's like those old prizes on BBC game shows where, you know, it was like they didn't have the $100,000 pyramid. They had the like one pound seven and five pyramid or something <laughs> like that and, uh, because they never paid very much money. Mm. Or, or what is it in British Bake Off? They, you know, it's like the, there's no prize. They just give you like a, a plate. A glass cake plate. <laughs> it's yeah, like, it's a glass cake like plate. That's why and that stuff yes, never, that well, I actually, that's British. popular. That's popular in the U.S., mm. but, but. So. So the question, I mean, they mentioned, they said something about they, they claim they did an assessment and let them know about their vulnerabilities before attacking them. Did they, which, I mean, did they really? It was, sta I it was they Staffordshire, did that against Staffordshire's Staffordshire. who I thought oh. they were talking to. Yeah, but now, maybe not. Oh, no. The hackers alleged to have informed Hemswater of its network security and adequacies and right. claimed that they acted responsibly by not encrypting their data and 
only exfiltrating five terabytes from the compromised system. And once again, doing a good thing for the cause. <laughs> By like, only exfiltrating five terabytes. Only, wow. yeah. Hey, 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 hey. That means that they've passed their EC Council certified ethical hacker exam. They have. Okay, let's be clear. This is probably what they were doing for the final oh, or something mm -hmm. like that. They're now ethical hackers. Mic drop. <laughs> But I really did think maybe it was just a big bluff that, that they went after Staffordshire, got some data, and then they went, let's just see if we can bluff these guys because they have deeper pockets. It's a bigger company, and, I, and maybe they thought they would get lucky. And not, they might have. You know, think about yeah, it. May, I mean, maybe not realizing that any of these are regionalized. Maybe not realizing. Yeah, I mean. And, maybe not knowing how to read a map. Um, yeah, and they were like Russians, so maybe that's not how water. I don't know anything about how the water works in Russia, but maybe. It, it probably flows downhill just like everywhere else. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> but yeah, it was an interesting story because of that. And and I mean, I'm sure this has happened before, but I, I, I was really on that. I think they're just trying to bluff. I think that they, they got in one and didn't get anywhere and they decided, let's bluff these other guys with the data and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, arguably, I think that was a really stupid move on their half behalf if it was a bluff or it was some stupidity. Reminds me back of a story we covered, oh God, almost 12, 13 years ago. Uh, when a bunch of um, uh, hackers broke into NVIDIA and they had full control of all of their uh, driver deployment, meaning they could have backdoored every NVIDIA driver that left NVIDIA mm -hmm. and had a botnet on every system that was deploying these. But instead they did something like uh, something equally as dumb as like a, set it up as a where server. Right. Like, <sighs> they they didn't know where they were and they didn't know what they had and didn't know what they could have gotten. Well, it's that. just kind of like people that break into your company and deface your website. Yep. I'm like, that's what you did. Yep. I, I you know I was like, really that you had you actually got it. I had I had a server once a long long time ago, and and this there was this uh, hacker group that was called Schwarzfeder, uh, which Same means type. black horse in German, but. Um, I, I think it was some of my former students, <clears> but they they hacked one of our web servers and they defaced it, you know, and all this. And I was like, that's what you chose to do with the fact that you got into this server instead of doing something subtle that you could have exploited and amused yourself for years with? You know, I mean, a, a pop-up message every now and then that just is in Klingon or something would be mm -hmm. so much more amusing than, than I'm just going to deface the web server and then they'll know something happened. So, yeah, I, I, I didn't understand this whole thing. It just seems like a foolish... <laughs> I guess we're cheering for the bad guys. Like, we need better bad guys out there. And I'm like... like but yeah, I mean, maybe they didn't understand that this is regional and these things are not affiliated with each other. That was, but who knows? Who knows? That's why we get to do conjecture, right? That's exactly right. You but know, was, I've got a friend that actually uh, lives in Thailand. He's Russian and he teaches uh, English and Thai and various languages to the Russians that moved to Thailand. And I'm like, okay, what kind of Russians moved to Thailand besides you? But you're weird. He's like, well... They're interesting people. <laughs> okay. Um, so what? It, what? It, he's like, they're normally running away from something or other, you know? And I'm like, okay, 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 cool, 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 cool. Um, so you're teaching them these languages and uh, cultural customs. He goes, oh. Like, what do you mean? He goes, language is actually easy compared to understanding that Russian customs are not universal. <laughs> they tend to try to bring their customs with them. And it looks like that's what happened here. Oh. Ill advised. Could be. Interesting. Yeah. All right, Lee, pick a story. How about uh, my number five? The the VNC instance is exposed. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure we've all used VNC. I'm yep. pretty sure we've all exposed things for convenience to the internet. But the huh. exposing VNC without a password? Really? This story killed me. When I saw the story, I, I was I saw this one on Tuesday. It I was like, really? Are you kidding me? I mean, I was really. I mean, yeah. And I know I felt naive then. I was like, no, mm -hmm. of course. But it, yeah, and then I and you read the story and you see there's, there's HMIs being exposed. There's all kinds of stuff. And I was like, yep, they needed people to work from home and they didn't know how to set it up, so they just slapped us in there and turned it on and went, yeah, we're, it'll be fine. Don't yep. worry I about mean, it. Lee, you, you say that like, oh, we've sure, oh, we've put things on the internet like that, and yeah, like that's how I got my start in internet information security was, yeah, I put stuff on the internet that I didn't know how to secure <laughs> and I needed remote access to it, and next thing you know, it's it's owned. <laughs> like, yeah, but but that was two thousand and one, somewhere yeah. between nineteen ninety nine and two thousand and one, and I learned from my mistakes right. since then. Like, 
And there was something like 600,000 uh, hits on that port. On, Eight, uh, 8, on, on 5,900 yep. on, on 5, TCP. How many was it? 8,000. I mean, which, which is still 7,999 too many. Well, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, so there was... I, I was yeah. People looking Remember back this. when we used to set up like we'd put a modem on a system with PC anywhere and and because nobody had the phone number we thought it was pretty obscure until the until the war dri- war dialer found us. Yep. I was thinking this is just like that except hey wait, showdown. Well, I mean there's Makes a there's a huge obvious. attitude. There's a huge attitude especially in ICS uh, industry that I've seen which is we're obscure, we're proprietary, we don't have any risk, but as as all this stuff is converged and now, instead of using incredibly weird proprietary stuff that that somebody bolted together with a, with with you know with welding and and a bunch of wire, yep. and it's called the the Lu Seven Thousand that some guy built in nineteen seventy eight. <laughs> you know, they're just using stuff they bought off the shelf now that that's regular old TCP IP. And I mean, yeah, they still use some obscure protocols, but mm-hmm. people know those protocols. They can yep. look them up if they don't and, know and, them. And even if they are really weird obscure protocols. You think back to some of the the dawn of you know phone freaking hacker culture, like you know we talk about Cult of the Dead Cow and Legion of Doom and all these folks, like these guys were and ladies were exploiting phone systems by finding information from manuals they pulled out of the dumpster and traded with uh, their friends. Mm-hmm. Like this is not rocket surgery. Somebody's going to figure this out. Yeah. I mean, that's it why is brain I, science, though. It is brain science, yes. But it, it just drives me crazy. And then I, I, I read that. I was like, am I reading this right? I mean, there's like this many without passwords. I mean, they didn't even bother to try to put a password on it. Well, they probably did, and then it didn't work. So they, they tried to set the mm. security. It didn't work, and the people are at home, and they're going, we can't get in still. And some poor hapless person is down at the factory where they're not supposed to be anyway because, you know, it's nobody's allowed in. And they went, look, I'm just going to open this. We'll worry about it later. And then there and, it sits. And the fact that there's still 8,000, it'd be interesting um, for someone to ping this um, <laughs> because what was it? Um, DEF CON, can't remember the number. The last um, fail panel, as it were, um, you know, Viss presented, and I believe his presentation at that fail panel was about you know, like VNC roulette, like you would connect to stuff from Shodan that was VNC enabled mm-hmm. with no password and just put up some of the scary shit that he found. Yeah. That was like DEF CON 26 or 27, I forget. I know exactly what you're talking it about, was, though, yeah. It was probably before, it was probably closer to 25, I maybe think it 24. Could be. Okay. It yeah. might have been 25, because I actually think I went to that session. I remember somebody sent me to that. I, rem- I remember the session. Probably. I, I was the, the moderator. I was the host, as it were. So, um, Yeah, that yeah. sounds familiar. Well, this, this is a good topic for that exact same arc, because 30 years ago, right about now, uh, we were launching Borderware, and in the first hour and a half, you know, me alone in my little 10 by 10 booth in Atlanta, uh, this guy comes up and says, I have an oil refinery. What do you do for me? <laughs> and I had a panic attack, having <laughs> just come from OT before that. And, you know, the, the real answer was nothing. Can't do a damn thing. You know, six folks and a dog, you know, a little firewall startup company in the early 90s. And then in 2000 at Cisco, the exact same thing happened. And now it's, you know, Cisco at that time is rocking. You know, the PIX was making $500 million a year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we couldn't not, we couldn't take our eyes off the, uh, you know, infinite number of features coming from the people who paid all the bills, at, you know, to make, you know, DNC, you know, any a fix up for a single OT protocol, you know, and you were still coming down that path, but, but, you know, 30 years later now, I think that the 80 to 90% of the people in OT who need to know about cybersecurity, get it, you know, the air gap wars are over. Um, it is, it is a different world. Um, I think, honestly, I think the IT has a lot to learn from OT because I, OT, uh, you know, writ large is way more mature than IT, not just mm-hmm. InfoSec. IT is, you know, still, wet behind his ears and infrastructure is 6,000 years old. <laughs> they know about process. Oh, do you I, remember? I, I, lo- I love that. I love that phrase. The air gap wars are over. <laughs> air gap wars yeah, there's skirmishes, are over. but yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's skirmishes. But... Yeah. Oh my God. I want to put that on a sticker. <laughs> the air gap wars are over. Well, Ooh. maybe just slight skirmishes. Yeah. Well, I'm, 
I, I remember I, I remember back when um oh, somewhere in the nineties working with somebody who'd had a lot of experience with Sun OS and a little bit of Solaris talking about you know, having to patch every 30 days because the system wouldn't be stable because of memory leaks and whatnot. Meanwhile, I'm sitting there working with an HPUX system that had been perfectly stable for and up for 400 days with no issues. <laughs> um, and then I think about the OT guys, and they would just basically say, you know, hold my beer. Yeah, 400 <laughs> days. Like, what, how about 4,000 days? You know, and it's like, I mean, I've seen those things where they're like, nobody even knows where this thing is plugged in anymore because it was walled up 20 years ago. I mean, I literally was in a factory like that. And they were like, yeah, I was like, where do those cables go? He was like, I don't know. They walled that up back in like, you know, 92. And, and it like, still works. And it, yeah, and it's, it still works. It's probably still working today. You know, it, it's like twin X cables going through a brick wall. And you're like, mm -hmm. yeah, those things will still work. And after the nuclear war, they'll, they'll still be working. Because that stuff does not die. No, remind, remind it me. does. It does. It does. You're wrong. Oh. It does. The problem is when it dies, it beeps like a goddamn air raid siren going off and it's walled <laughs> up in the fucking wall and you have to <laughs> tear the fucking wall apart to figure out what the fuck went on. And there's this one piece of yellowed paper taped to it with the maintenance contract number on it. And you call the company. And you're like, we have a maintenance contract. Are we up on it? Yeah, you're still paying on that. Come fix it. We can't. The guy died that knew how to do that shit. Yeah, I had one. I had one that just had like it said, <laughs> call Max and had a number on it. <laughs> and so we call the number and you know it's like hello and it's like hi i guess i'm trying to reach max and she's like max died like seven years ago you know and yeah and the guy was dead and i'm like so are you max's replacement are you just holding the fort and she's like no i'm his widow <laughs> and you know i'm like okay so yeah we're screwed I have to get the ouija board out well, I, lo I love maritime sector because it's so extreme but all ot is the same way and the, th the reality is you know, we we you know we cyber people come in really excited. Oh my god, you know, somebody can hack it, you know, and, and break something. And and real OT folks say, yeah, things break all the time. Mm -hmm. And they kill people. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's you know, welcome to my Wednesday, right? I've got these backup plans and they may or may not be right, but when the bridge fails, you know, then you build a new bridge. And that's you know, as he that's, looks, as he looks these the lessons have been pounded in for literally centuries, right? You know, where we're trying to make the perfect hot dog. Yep. Well, he, that, that's he the used, difference. Chris, use, Eric, Chris, Chris, the Chris, 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 Chris. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Chris OT using the bridge analogy looking over his shoulder. Blood. What? Chris using the bridge analogy looking over his shoulder behind uh -huh, him. At the bridge. Yep. Oh, good point. <laughs> yeah, Chris, the OT rules are written in blood. Oh, yeah, yeah right. Uh, the, yeah, electric linesmen die on the job. We lose money. The IT rules, we lose money. The OT rules are written, you know, the IT rules are written in green. The OT rules are written in red. And there's the primary difference, and I'll shut up there. Yeah, I saw I saw one once where the process on the wall said, if green light goes on, blow whistle loudly several times. And I asked the guy who built this whole place, and I was like, so what does the green light mean? And he goes, oh, it's a radiation leak. <laughs> and I was like, so when people hear the whistle, what do they do? And he's like, run like hell. <laughs> and I, I was like, so if they don't run fast enough, he's like, well, yeah, then they're dead, so they don't matter anyway. So, yeah, but blow it, you know, just blow it a couple of good, good time give it a couple of good toots there everybody knows what it means they'll run yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, did you test it <laughs> <laughs> no that would have been bad because then they would have yeah they would have not liked that at okay. all and you don't want to mess with old-time engineers because they tend to put like you know radioactive iodine in your shoes or something so Oof. so yeah. the, did i tell you about the time i was walking through a, a building went through an unmarked open door and looked up in the big chamber i was at and the manipulating arms i was on the business end oh dear oh that would be frightening. Turned out it was had, had actually been cleaned out years before, but somebody, you know, was playing a joke. Oh but my that's a pucker that, that's, that's a pucker moment. Yeah, you might need a new pair of pants. That would yeah, no, I I, I would have scared me because I mean I knew what those rooms looked like and yeah, you would not want to see the manipulator uh, arm. One one thing I wanted to ask Chris because of you know where he lives, what's the current multiplier when I say marine followed by some piece of technology? I'm not sure I understand the question. What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, it used to be if say you wanted a, a, a say you wanted a, a a radio for your house, you'd you know you'd pay a hundred bucks. But if you wanted the marine version, right. it was like two thousand. Well, you know, that's a great great question because you know I have used very few marine parts on these boats for exactly that reason. You know because you know like like motors. You know like, like, it, the the head 
for like a 12, 20, I forget, 12 or 20 horse Yanmar uh, diesel, standard, you know, sort of mm-hmm. sailboat diesel, diesel motor, it's about seven grand. And if it fails, you know, having two, you know, bo- of those on a, on a boat isn't really practical. Nope. Um, I have $500, 24 pound uh, trolling motors, and I have, I don't know, three of them on this boat. I got sort of eight motors. I sailed these boats, you know, 600 kilometers, or almost 1,000 kilometers in total, and things break all the damn time. Don't care, right? You know, you don't need to. A lot of standard models work this way, as we're talking about with John Deere, right? You know, the classic model was you weld, you know, forge it out of primal steel, you hammer it, you know, and put steam through it, and run it for, you know, for decades. You know, now it's not. You know, the marine space, like you say, Lee, you know, it's, you know, this can opener is seven hundred dollars because it's it's made. No, I'll just get two. Right, you'll get two right. of the ten dollar ones, or three right. of the ten dollar yeah. ones. Yeah, redundant systems. You want those in extreme environments, anyways. Any sort of infrastructure that matters. So, yeah, yeah. Lots of hulls, lots of motors, lots of battery systems, multiple battery systems, multiple solo controllers. You know, you could basically shoot, you know, shotguns at these boats, and something will still work and it'll still float. Mm-hmm. And and, cool. and and Chris, I think that's an interesting approach that you've taken with that. <clears throat> and uh, I followed along on your uh, uh, trip to Canada and Moat Mountain. And I drew some inspiration from that a little bit and like, yeah, I've got this $30 IoT based webcam that I put under a piece of Tupperware and it survives Canadian winter. And if it doesn't, I'll just buy another $30 or $40 camera as opposed to getting the marine variety that costs $900 and is ultimately going to fail in the same way. Well, and you feel like an idiot if you don't do the 17 hours of research on on that. Yeah, we don't have time for that. You know, (laughs) it's a camera. And it was thirty dollars, right? Yeah. Right. Yep. And you know, I'm amazed some of them survived. This I actually have Sam, the first <gasps> camera that I put on uh, Mark Twain. This is dead now, but this was screwed to a two by four for in you know, starting in July of 2019 for a year or so. And Twenty bucks at mm-hmm. Home Depot. Right. <laughs> Instead of spending you know three thousand dollars at the Marine store for one that lasts a little bit longer. Yeah, and the and the buying selection decision was about thirty seconds. Oh, look, camera. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, you just have a yeah. I just have redundancy, and you're fine. Yep. Mm-hmm. If it blows up, you climb out there on the on the deck and slap another one on there. Exactly. Because I'll tell you what, you know, the nine hundred dollar cameras, those break too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No. Yep. I my experience is from from sailboats. So there was one more factor. If it was up the mast, you spent the money. Yeah. That you don't want to go up, up the man. Yeah, I've, I've, all sailors, including myself, have had that moment when you're going like, I'm gonna try pulling this bosun's chair up the mast with me in it, and there's nobody else out here, and you get maybe mm-hmm. like a little bit up, and you start to realize this is a really, a really bad, bad idea. idea, and maybe I should do this with some assistance. But yeah, if it's up the mast, you should probably spend the money. Assistance and medical on standby. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Everybody's everybody that's ever had a sailboat's done that though. I mean, at, at some point oh, yeah. you were like, "Oh, that bulb's out. I should fix that." And there's nobody else here today. I I guess I could pull myself up. I mean, like that's why they have these things. And I'm sure old time sailors did it. And then you go, "Yeah, they all died too." So <laughs> it was like you know, you lose a few people. It's like yep. no big deal. Yeah, and they all had to wash their shit out of their shorts overboard, just like I'm gonna have to. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, well, I mean, if you look at the median age of. A uh, 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 life expectancy of sailors back to uh, three hundred oh, years yeah, ago. Exactly. Um, you're over it. Well, yeah. yeah. Ca- yeah. Ca- Captain Double. Cook's people didn't last very long. She just got some more at the next mm-hmm. port. Speak- like, speak- hey, we're signing up. Yeah. <laughs> Shiny new copper piece. Speaking yeah, of life well. expectancy, what's next on the agenda? <laughs> hey. Um, oh, let, wanna, can we talk about? about the, oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, it's fine. Go ahead, Lee. So I was actually. Wondering, did you guys look at the one about the cybersecurity tit for elect for protecting elections? I beg your pardon. So, uh, CISA came out with a uh, in in collaboration with a joint cyber defense came up with this uh, assessment for for uh, election systems where basically you're supposed to do an uh, assessment. It's a ten page multi question huh. uh, spri- uh, form you fill out, and it basically uses it to do priority base remediation you know help you figure it out i'm just wondering and it's really cool looking but i'm not and it defaults to higher levels of risk not lower which is cool but i'm just wondering 
is the average election official qual- uh, qualified, familiar with, et cetera, to, to make that kind of an assessment, honestly? Hmm. So it just I, I, cl- I click through the links, and, and quite honestly, I'm looking at the questionnaire right now. Yeah. I mean, it's it's, it's a cool-looking tool. I don't, don't, yeah. not, not knocking it. I'm just thinking, and, and they ask good questions. I mean, I think these are the kind of questions any of us would walk a customer through, except we'd be guiding them if they were thinking they were opportunistic. I mean, it made me think of Josh and his CMMC work, uh, you know, because... You know, that's, that's, you know, it's about maturity, right? But it's about maturity. I'm just wondering yeah. if, I'm being, if I'm being overly cynical and people will actually play it straight. Well, I think they need something like this. And I know I, I just saw an article yesterday about how they're so shorthanded, you know, that they're like, they can't get people, poll workers and all these kind of things. So oh. they probably also don't have people to do their security assessments. But, you know, so they, if they have a toolkit, they might actually try to use it, but probably some will, yeah. some won't. I mean, where well, I where I mean, used to live, they had the ultimate election security toolkit. It's it's called a bunch of old ladies that live in that town that know literally every person who lives in the town. Because <laughs> when I first moved there and I went in to vote, and the lady said, "Who the hell are you?" and I said, "Oh, I just moved here." And you and I learned real quick in New England, you had to tell you couldn't say, "Oh, I moved into this address." I had yep. to say, "I moved into Allie's house." And yes. then they would go, oh, Allie, yeah, he moved to the vineyard, right? And I'm like, yeah, he did. And they're like, and you're living in his house. I'm like, yes, I am. And after that, I was good. Every time I went to vote for the next 20 years, uh. the, the lady would go, hey, it's a guy that lives in Allie's house. So that, that, <laughs> now that's election security right welcome, there. Welcome to New England. You'll welcome never get small. around that system because those old ladies would come right at you. I mean, they're going to get yeah, you. No. No. Well, that, that reminds me of like uh, the election security for what the first reporting the uh, place that reports the presidential election um, in New Hampshire. I can't remember. Out of the, town. I can't remember the <laughs> name. I've, sta- I've, sta- I've stayed in a bed and breakfast there uh, before Airbnb was is a it, thing. Is it, some- uh, something Junction. Yeah, I can't think of what it is. It's really famous, though. You, I, I would think I would think of it. But, oh. like, yeah, the election security there has got to be pretty easy because there's, <laughs> yeah, like, there's like two, nine people. Uh, yeah, it's like <laughs> there's something ridiculous. Hey, Bill. Like that. Yep. <laughs> Well, that's exactly the way Warren was. I mean, it was really like that. They knew everybody. And any stranger that walked in there, they you know, they immediately descended on you. Like, who are you and why are you here? And Dixville Notch. Dixville Notch, that's yes. It. It's a notch. Not a junction. Not a junction. Make no mistake. Notch. Do not confuse notches and junctions. Larry, that explains why you have so many kids. I confuse <laughs> notches and junctions. Mm-hmm. 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 He's always mm-hmm. thinking notch when he means junction. Resist. <laughs> uh, wow, or maybe that's the other way around. I'm not sure. Either way, apparently Doug's confused them too. <laughs> oh. the, the real problem oh. we have with election, regardless of all this, though, is going to be the perception, right? Yes. You know, you know, we put these things together, right? We all know that the maturity of cybersecurity is not robust. We're not done developing it yet. Um, you have CISA. I think Chris Krebs and Jenny Slee and everybody else there is doing you know good work, but. You know, we have a, a you know, we don't all agree as a profession exactly what cybersecurity includes and contains. And we're trying to communicate it in this example, you know, some steps down to a very large number of very you know, interesting dem- demographic of folks and expect them to do things. So we have two questions, you know, one, will that be effective? And two, will any of people, anybody believe it is right? Now, given that we know that every individual part of everything I just said will be used by threat actors you know, to lower the Americans' confidence in the election system regardless. Yeah, oh, true. I completely agree. I mean, and you, you'll see that. It depends on, you know, it's just like I, we were talking about that Y2K stuff earlier. If, if they come in and, you know, they, they make a big deal about that it's not safe, even if it is, and they find some janitor who goes, yeah, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't trust it. You know, and then that's what they're going to air, and then people won't trust it. It won't matter how many tests they did or if it was totally safe or what, whatever it was. They don't, yeah. Ugh. Well, we all, we all look at things through our own little straw, and that, you know, that Colombian 25-year thing, I, you know, is the only time I've gone through that sort of exercise, but it's 50 million people, right? And this, mm-hmm. you know, this is enough years ago now that that, you know, these issues weren't exactly on everybody, top of everybody's tongue, but, you know, cognitive mm-hmm. security, you know, in that first seven years, which we're in the middle of, it's hard to get it all finished, but at the national level, you look at 10 years, and if you, if we can't agree 
on what information is real or not, then how do we know that the power, the, the individual sitting in a power station will or won't turn it off? You know, if I believe that the city's on fire, then maybe I just turn it off. So regardless of any of the you know technical uh, steps we put in place, where we can't actually believe, you know, agree on reality, you know, how do we actually mm-hmm. at, at the end of the day operate in infrastructure or anything else? This is, this is what the, the the typical war games example, like the the two guys in the silo that receive the orders to launch the nuclear missiles, and how do they know whether the data that they've actually got is real, and whether they should turn the key or not, so they replace the key with technology? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of them didn't which has turn no the key. judgment, right? Which has no discretion, which has no uh, human emotions, which is Correct. reliable. And do you remember that in the 1960s there was the one man that saved the world? He was a Russian guy that said, "Wait, yeah, something's wrong." He was supposed Don't to turn launch, the keys. Yeah, they had a false launch detected, and uh, he was supposed to turn the key, and he didn't. Yep, mm-hmm. I don't remember that because I wasn't born then. But <laughs> Lee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I've heard that was eighty-seven, so November eleventh. It was the night of my my wife and I's first date. So, oh wow, nice, nice. Could have so, been it. Could have been the first and only. Had right, the, had been, had, it had been had short. Yeah, three eighty-three. Don't tell her. Oh remember. shit, it was eighty-three. How old was I? Yeah, eighty-three. I think. Don't don't worry, Chris. We won't tell her because I'm the same way. I got to write that shit down. <clears throat> yeah. was, I, swear mm. to, I, I swear to God, I have a plaque on the front of our house that says "House of Pesci established" with our wedding anniversary written on it. Because I can't remember. Oh, my, yep. My wife and I both forgot our nineteenth birthday. I think that's a, the perfect sign of a good good marriage. It was a couple of days later where we looked at each other. It's like, wait, did we miss our anniversary? Yeah, we've done that before. <laughs> I was just like, my, I was like, I think we have. Don't we have an anniversary or something? And, and my <laughs> wife was like, Oh, I, I guess, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I can't pull that one because we have a Swedish anniversary that was the shotgun wedding and the American anniversary and they're two weeks apart. So if I can't get it together, I'm in deep shit. Uh. <laughs> uh, if, if, I so need that, if I need that for my wife, I just go, look, the tax code changed and she's that's it. You don't have to see her again. For a while. <laughs> she's a tax nerd. Oh, oh. Speak- she likes no. tax code the way Larry likes Wi-Fi. So, it's just like, you know, yeah. Yep. So I was actually thinking of uh I think it was I was thinking a little bit about Larry with my number ten story. Uh-oh. That there you that somebody's come up with a new a newish <laughs> Windows seven calculator DLL attack. <laughs> because there's lots of Windows seven out there still. Yeah. Uh, there's enough. Yep. Yeah. I, I think it's also hilarious that like all the demos that we've done for how many years to illustrate like, oh my god, hex was pop to, was to pop calculator. Yeah, <laughs> Cal- 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 the reason I thought of you. <laughs> like, she. Oh. Pretty sure we popped calculator in one of your classes. I'm, um, yep. I can't rule it out. I just can't. No, you can't. But I mean, um, I mean, that's such a great example, though, to me, of like this sort of gestalt supply chain problem that exists, where people designed a lot of stuff and wrote a lot of code, and never would have ever considered that that code could be risky. Because they didn't think about it like that. I mean, no. it's these you know isolated things. It's that a calculator. Are, Who's gonna? Well, I mean, I mean, it's not so much. I'm thinking no, nobody would hack it. It's just like nobody could get to it. You know, I mean, if yeah. you're writing if you're writing code in in 1995 or something, you weren't really thinking about oh, all these people are going to have access to this. It was just more like oh yeah, it'll be on somebody's local machine. So you wouldn't even think about security. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, if if you were really radical in that in in the, in the early nineties, you you were you were using the f word too, as in firewall. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I mean, Chris is nodding his head. I mean, uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, Chris, Chris, they were nothing like what we have today. But at that time, that was actually <laughs> kind of rare. Well, early nineties, anyway. Very rare. Well, Chris, you were involved with firewalls pretty heavily back then, weren't you? Yeah, I, I think I still have the, the napkin. It was, as cliche as it is, it was a Chinese restaurant. It was me and Paul Hunt and uh, Clyde Stevens. And uh, we've been selling uh, internet connection equipment, you know, port masters to the early ISPs and dial-up routers to, the, to customers. And every single one of the customers couldn't use them. So I drew a little box for the usual sort of thing and said, well, we need to, we need to make a little box for people that would do their DNS and email and go for an FTP. And it's like, we've got to do security as well. 
So, but that, you know, so border, the, the term firewall was already invented and there was, a, there was, I think there were like a hundred firewalls in the world. They average seven computers and a million dollars a year at the time. Yeah. Fun, fun, fun. <laughs> the good old days. Be, speaking of, uh, Leah and and Doug about you know oh, code that nobody's ever going to get to touch. Um, there was an amazing uh, write up in in my opinion um, from uh, a person that goes by the name of Green Luigi One. Uh, my story number where is it? My story number four. How I hacked my car. Hyundai. Yep, a 2021 Hyundai Ionic SEL. No, and not that kind of hack. Oh, um, it's like... So, uh, effectively, they hacked the in-vehicle infotainment uh, system, uh, which used um, Android Auto and a whole bunch of other fun stuff. Um and he wanted to go above and beyond of just potential um, installing an APK of an application that was already there. He wanted to figure out how he could run his own application and walk through the entire process of obtaining firmware, um, having to uh, decrypt the firmware that it was encrypted with a password, um, and, and figuring out where specific files were that were within the operating system with um, redundancy checks for whether or not the file system was encrypted and the files were recalculated for checksums and being able to update these things to get stuff to run on start and provide remote execution and a lot of this stuff hadn't been done before on this particular platform. So he was sort of charting, they, they were sort of charting new territory. Tor so it's a three-part series, and I think I linked to part number one. <clears throat> and down towards the end of part number one, I think some of the absolute abject failures that I, I came up with some of this type of stuff was both in the encryption of the firmware... So the compression and the encryption of the, hard, the the firmware and some of the default stuff for um, uh, the updates using OpenSSL mm -hmm. used keys that were used as part of the examples for the programming stuff. For example, um, for creating the zip file, the password that they used were in the zip documentation as an example password that one would use, meaning the developer is literally copied and pasted out of the zip documentation, including the passphrase and everything. Um, <laughs> another one, um, there's some encryption for AES 128, 128-bit uh, CBC. And he recovered the key from the firmware for the update function. Turns out if you go and look at the uh, NIST document SP838A, the CBC EA AES128 encryption key and IV are identical to the ones that were used in the software. Hmm. <laughs> step, step one. <laughs> um, and uh, this particular... Uh, person is a software developer so then it turns into about how can I get around some of the checks and the processes um, and uh, eventually you know, get access to the CAN bus and develop my own application to run on the display with a GUI so that I can touch a button on the display and it unlocks all my doors and having to reverse <laughs> and having to reverse engineer all of the API and that type of stuff for interacting with uh, the CAN bus and mm. so from exploitation to creation of application, I thought was amazing in this three-part series and was well, very well written. I think this I've, guy uh, went nuts. He uh -huh. went nuts. Yeah, <laughs> just I just went through the first part, and it's like, oh my god. 
I, I think this, this is, is just more of that old time make it work and you yeah. know people, people that are full on war games I'm going to read everything about this thing and learn everything about it and then I'm going to fuck you up <laughs> but the the companies just don't perceive it that way. They don't perceive that somebody would take this much time and energy to do that, and so they don't worry about it. And then somebody does, and they publish it, and now you know every now they're going to be like, like to, just as an example. I quickly found out that to get my navigation thing into update mode, I had pr pressed to the left of update button ten times, and then to the right of the update button once. And it went into engineering mode. And that, in one sentence, he glosses over how many fucking times did he press that panel. Yeah. Yep. A lot. Like, exactly. Damn. Exactly. Well, honestly, I bet that part was something that was well documented. Like you think about going into developer mode under Android. Yeah. It's a well documented process. I bet this is probably a well documented probably. process under Android. Probably Auto. a manual or something. Somebody got out there somewhere. You but still, you got to go learn everything about this thing to find the manual to go into engineering mode, and then. He had a pin. But there was already a guide out there to tell him that for his particular device that the pin was probably already calculated and it was probably it a was default 2400. 2, yeah, and so he just tried that and it worked. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, oh. it, it just goes to show you, be persistent. And when you run into things, don't just immediately go, well, I'll never crack this. Just, you know, it may be zero, 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 zero. Yep. <laughs> well, and even along the way, as you get into part two, they changed the code because of one of the updates. And he still went and figured it out by going into the logs and <clears throat> kept yep. gotten right back at it. It's, this is crazy cool. Yeah. God, a lot of damn work, though. And, Holy and, moly. and you think about this, too, is like I, I just went and clicked on the link uh, where they noted this guy to help me figure out my pin. Like, it was basically, all right, if you enter engineering mode in this manner... And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten different ways to enter engineering mode or dealer mode. Depending on which mm -hmm. way you enter it and which one works on your system, the pin. this is the pin. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it may be one of about 12 different pins. So just try them all. It's just like appliance hacking. Yep. We've, so, all, we've all been if there. You be a, if you want to be a hacker... Not just a pen tester, not just a forensic expert, not just a blah, blah. If you want to be a hacker, by the way, pen tester does not equal hacker. Mm -hmm. It can. No, hack, a lot of hackers, have hackers. Multi, hackers have a lot of hackers that are not pen testers. Let's be clear. But if you want to be a hacker, read this frigging article. And by the way, also read The Cuckoo's Egg by Cliff Stoll. Those two examples will make you realize what it takes, what it took 20 or 30 years ago and what it takes now. And a multimeter. That's <laughs> All right, good. I'm sorry, but you can't be a hacker unless you have a multimeter. I mean, it's just, it's just like if you don't have a multimeter with you, you're not a real hacker. I, I mean, this comes down to uh, one of the examples that we do in, in the, the wireless class for SANS for 617 in that don't underestimate the power of someone who wants access to something they can't have and are bored. Mm -hmm. I call that prisoner, <laughs> prisoner syndrome. No, I mean, that's literally what I call it, it because I, I remember a long time ago I, I was talking to this guy uh, who, was the, who was the director of the Federal Prison Bureau, and, and he was just giving us all these examples of stuff that people do. You know, like they were, they were literally making like cell phone antennas out of like electrical outlets and just crazy stuff that, you know, and, like, and he's like, yeah, they're bored. They don't have anything better to do. Yep. So they can sit there and try 8,000 permutations of this until they get it right. And it, it's also true of like, you know, when you're 14 years old and you, you're too young to drive, you mm -hmm. just sit there and do stuff. You know, it's when people learn to play the guitar really well or, <laughs> or learn how to write code because, you know, what else could you do is like, you're just sort of stuck there and yep. you start writing code and, and doing all kinds of stuff. And you learn it really, really well because you, you're not distracted sure. from it by other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, have you ever watched any of those people that go on like TikTok or TikTok or Instagram that were in prison and they show you how to cook prison food? Yeah. Like, holy crap, like that stuff that you bought out of the cantina and you make burritos out of it in your prison <laughs> cell by taking a candle and heating up your underneath your mattress so you can cook this tortilla that you made out of crushed up Cheetos. And I'm like, yep, you got way too much time in your hands. Oh, yep. right. Oh, you in prison. You got nothing <laughs> right. better to do. So it's right. like you can try it a hundred different ways until you get one that works. And yep. then you'll be the famous Cheeto taco guy. Yep, exactly. Oh, my God.
You're all bad. Um, it's true, true, too. I mean, I worked as a, a jail guard down in Louisiana for several years, and it's literally like they'll just sit there. You, you, the concrete's double painted, but they will sit there and rub something on the concrete to get the paint up so they can sharpen something, and it'll take them a year. They don't care. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, they will they literally got paint. They'll, they'll do anything they can think of to get any advantage they can think of to do anything they want. Yep. Ain't got nothing but time. Yeah, oh, man. <laughs> uh, Lee, you got another story? I have one. Oh, let's oh, go down oh, here. Let's oh, take okay. a look. What do you got? Do Lee, then Doug. All right. Uh, to, to, how about the uh, the signal leak? 1,900 users had their, uh, there was a data breach at Signal. Basically, it was actually because of Twilo, who they uh. were using for uh, validation of phone numbers. They actually got uh, hacked and they fell to a phishing attack. Oh my gosh! And uh, they pretty much now nineteen hundred Signal users were were phone numbers where they're trying to keep secret and Signal were now out and available. Um, and I'm all I keep thinking is, you know, you really got to make sure your partner security's right. Um, mm-hmm. we, how many times have we played that tune? You know? Yeah, and that's a tough that's a tough tune to dance to. Yeah, I mean, there's, you, you know, you may have so many things embedded. It's just so difficult, and yeah, I find that very frustrating. But I don't know what to do about it either. Yeah, and I don't know how they could have better protected themselves. I don't. I'm not sitting here with an answer that says if they'd only done this. Uh, um, well, I'm saying, you know, they probably should have been up on their security, but and but I don't know that that. Now, I'm not saying it's a silver bullet. It's just mm. the path. I mean, and, and Lee, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you think about you know exactly what you said. They said they got fished, like they exploited the weakest part of the system, which was the human. And it, like, what could they have done better? Well, uh, replace the humans with the little computer that does the thing automatically for them, and that doesn't have any emotion and doesn't. Maybe that's not such a good idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, at least Signal jumped on notifying people. Yeah. You know, they, they didn't let it go by. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't wait around, or it doesn't appear they waited around for you know tertiary ver- validation. They just got on there and said, "Hey." Yeah, I, I'd also say good. Good on uh, Twilio um, to note that something had happened after only sign up for nineteen hundred users. Yeah, and, and notifying their partners. Yeah, this so responsible behavior there. Yeah, so the. Sure. 19, uh, so, so, Lee, I'm going to take a little tw- different twist on this. So, uh, 1,900 people had some data exposed and potentially had their signal accounts hacked. But it was only 1,900. Only 19, uh, yeah. I don't and, know. Out of uh, how many millions? Exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. arguably it was during sign-up and, and some of those types of things for verification. So that makes number. disclosing it even more honorable because, uh, you know, yeah. a lot of people would be pressured not to disclose that yeah. for that small number <laughs> yeah. and uh, and bring all the grief that comes with exposing it. Doc, are you saying that companies cover up breaches? No, I, oh. would, I would never say that for fear of disappearing on the way home tonight. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dr. Well, Doug we, White we are, found shot twice in the back of the uh-huh. head. He must have committed suicide. Exactly. <laughs> uh, anyway. All right, all right, Doug, you got a story? Well, I was going to talk about just briefly about this, uh, the, the fraud cybercrime insurance case. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this, this company in Minnesota sued their insurance providers, a cyber insurance provider. Yep. And... They basically claimed because there's different levels of payout depending on whether something is considered fraud or it's computer considered computer fraud. Hmm. So there's slightly different things going on here. So the the computer fraud part means that a, a piece of equipment was used somehow to commit fraud, and that paid out the full amount. But if it was considered social engineering, they uh. only paid like a tenth of the amount. And so this was an email phishing attack. Uh, it cost them a bunch of money, and they wanted the full amount paid because they said email constituted computer-based uh-huh. attack. And the insurance company, which was Travelers uh, Casually, said, no, that's not. That's social engineering. So that's not the same thing. Mm. And that's on you. So we're only paying like this tenth amount. Uh, you know, It has a cap of $100,000 per incident or something like that on the policy. 
and a judge agreed with the insurance company and threw the case out. And so I guess my reason for bringing this story up was not so much that it's an interesting piece of security as much as it's something you should probably look at in your cyber policies to see that you truly understand what you're insuring and how much coverage you actually have and how those things are going to be defined. Because if your coverage mm -hmm. says social engineering is only covered at 10%, you may not actually have the amount of coverage you think you have for something like, say, a ransomware attack that originated from an email. Because if that case becomes a precedent, then every insurance company on earth is going to cite that as a precedent on yep. those cases. And so if you get social engineered and so many of the attack vectors are social engineering, at least at the beginning, then they're going to be able to pay you a lot less, which is fine. And I don't have a problem with any of it as long as everybody understands what's going on. And so if your policy says that, you need to be aware of that and say, this isn't going to cover our needs. So I, that was why I wanted to bring that up because I think people should take a, a, a long, hard look at their site and cyber understand cyber insurance is an, as an evolving field. It, it has changed from we'll cover anything, go back a few years. And it was just like, yeah, sure. We give you a cyber policy. Yep. Cause I remember I called an insurance company blind just to see what they would do for a, a potential client who asked me to do that. And you know, they're like, yeah, it's covered whatever losses. <laughs> and up to, there was sort of now, uh, and we're in an interregnum period on insurance where a lot of companies either stopped writing policies or they put massive caps on them because of ransomware. And they don't want to be on the hook for millions and millions and millions of dollars. So they put a cap on your policy of $100,000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you want to be sure that you understand what your policy actually says and what that means in terms of the law because obviously these people were caught off guard at SJ Computers when they thought they were going to have coverage for this, uh, what they said they lost $600,000 as a result of this attack. And then the insurance company says, well, yeah, but we only pay a, you know, a small portion of that in the case of social engineering. So sorry, gotcha. Yeah. And uh, which, you know, I mean, nobody likes to hear that after the, after the fact. So you definitely should take yeah. a time to review. I actually would raise the bar on you, Doug, and say, you know, even if you play on on TV, get 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 a legal opinion and, and absolutely not, not your buddy down the street. Pay somebody. Well, I was implying you were having corporate legal review your policy. Yeah, not not you. So, uh, so yeah. I just I just went straight at it. Well, thank you for. Yeah, I, I that's exactly what I meant, Lee, and I completely agree with you that that it don't yeah don't get the guy down at at you know that the gas station to give you advice <laughs> on, on this. It would be far better to have your attorney look at it. And I understand some of you don't have attorneys, but you may want to get one if you're trying to buy cyber policies because uh, you know insurance is very very twitchy kind of business and if mm -hmm. you're if your company's going to go under because your policy can't provide what you think it's providing you may be getting s swindled mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of cyber insurance swindles out there too and i'm you know travelers is a, is a long established and respected company uh but that doesn't mean there's not less respectable companies out there who might be willing to give you a lot of double talk and quick sales tactics to get you to sign on the dotted line and then when you find you think you're covered you don't actually have it and it may take not only an attorney it may take a swarm of attorneys uh in order in order to, to sort your way through the 16,000 pages of documentation that they're going to hand you about this stuff so read carefully <laughs> not that I'm cynical or anything no did, I, I apologize but did you ever see the uh there's a video of a, a Uber driver where the cops pulled him over and arrested his passenger and he's videoing because he's like, this is weird. I'm going to video this. Like, you have to turn that off. He's like, why? Like, there's a law. He goes, no, there's not. Like, oh, yeah. what are you, a lawyer? He pulls out his bar card. He's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I've seen that one. Yep. And they're like, well, well, but what, what? Why are you Why are you driving Uber? He goes, sometimes law doesn't pay very much. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I like meeting people. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh... And getting tased for filming. Yeah, no. <laughs> so your point about not using the guy at the gas station, I'm sorry, that just came to mind because sometimes lawyers show up in the weirdest places. Well, it's fine if the guy at the gas station is an insurance attorney, but you know, slightly unlikely. I agree with you. I agree with you. But I you should ask because you know, don't, don't assume stuff just because the guy's repairing mufflers. That, that doesn't mean he's not an attorney. It just means right. he, he might be an expert muffler repairman and attorney. Right. It's, it's a common career, you know, bolt on. <laughs> and uh, muffler, muffler law is like, Damn, I mean, you a know, tree law. I mean, yeah, you you end up in muffler court. You are, I'm talking, Screwed. yeah, Screwed. it's 
Spe- speaking of uh, muffler bo- boltons, <laughs> um, Doug. No, that's not this show. You, uh, <laughs> you you threw one for me on your story number five. Uh oh, because it had a lot of words that I didn't understand from the title <laughs> and stuff, like. CS colon go trading site hack to steal six million dollars worth of skins. I'm like, what? Like, is this a porn story or like? <laughs> no, what? no, no. Well, that was why I looked at it. Go, yeah. No, it's Counter Strike Global Offensive. Yeah, it's like a bunch of, of sites that. So a lot of these uh, online gaming worlds now, and 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 I'm not a big gamer either, but a lot of a lot of the online gaming stuff, you know, they have their own currencies, they have their own, uh, you know, trading markets and all kinds yep. of stuff. And, I, and I've always thought that was quite interesting because, you know, people literally take their actual money and they mm-hmm. put it in a game mm-hmm. in the form. And I don't mean to buy the game. I mean to actually put it in the game and it becomes, you know, shekels or whatever are in the game. <laughs> and if you have enough shekels, you can buy the, you know, magic sword of the damned or whatever. Yep. And, or this neat hat. Or, yeah, I want to have a, you know, like I remember years and years ago, I knew somebody who was a friend and he was selling tattoo designs on Second Life. Oh, and people were buying right. these tattoo designs from him and, yep. and putting them on their second life characters. Pictures. Yep. And I was like, what? And he's probably doing pretty well. He was he was actually making you know money off this. And, of course, there was an exchange rate and all this kind of stuff. But so this the reason I thought this story was interesting for our viewers maybe is I know we have a lot of – there's a lot of gamers in, in the hacking community and so mm-hmm. forth. But this particular attack meant that this money that you have put into this game was suddenly – gone yep. in, the, um, in the form of stolen assets and, and stolen items and things but it also means that you may want to be careful about how much money you put into these things mm-hmm. because you have no idea how this works and it's not insured it's not covered by any i mean these servers may be in another country where the law is completely different yep and you have absolutely no recourse to get this money back. And I mean, yeah, stuff like Counter Strike, which is big, big, big thing. But there's tons of small games that you have no idea where they're sp- they're based, and they use these same tactics. So it's certainly really scary. Not to mention, if you've invested a lot of money in one of these games, like to build up your character or whatever, uh, for whatever reason, and no judgment, uh, and somebody steals all that stuff from you, it kind of sucks. So. Once again, you may need the guy down at the gas station to give you some advice. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, the, that's the lawyer that works at the gas station to give you some advice uh, before you yeah. sink large amounts of money in this. Now, this this ended up being six million dollars worth the, of theft. The, the scale of this was pretty interesting. So it was uh, CS dot money, which was the trading platform, um, and their trading platform had uh, just over sixteen hundred unique skins for fifty three weapons. And they were managing a total asset worth of sixteen point five million dollars. Yeah. In Counter Strike <laughs> Go Global Online. Right. Currency. Currency. Which they had six million dollars worth of their virtual online assets stolen. Ah. What? Three two fifths of their it's, assets, roughly? Yeah. Yep. Um, so. um 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 uh halting state. Charles Strauss wrote a book. A science fiction book about a, 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 a multi a, an MMORPG having the bank hacked and all of the money stolen. There's actually like a book about in-game economies. And I read it, I, I don't even remember how long ago. And I was like, holy shit, that's real. Mm-hmm. Well, when I first saw, I, Second Life was the first time I saw that kind of thing. And that there was an actual exchange rate established yeah. between US dollars and euros yeah. and things for... The, I don't remember what they were called, the Second either. Life currency, but it had some name. And I was thinking, this is just about, and I'm pretty conservative about this kind of stuff. I was like, this is just about crazy. I'm going to take my money and I'm going to tr- I'm gonna convert it into some, and of course, this is long before cryptocurrency. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. I'm going to convert it into some whacked out thing that's in this like artificial world. And I'm going to assume that that's going to hold any value at all. And of course, you know, I I mean, I guess it's still around, but it's pretty scary. I I know people who still, and I'm using the air quotes, play Second Life. Yeah, because you just roam around in there and and, yeah. Here, here, Doug, let me pass you some more of my (laughs) Kool-Aid. Is it the cherry? (laughs) Yes, it is. Awesome. But anyway, uh, I, it's an interesting story about something I, I didn't really know that much about. I mean, I, I saw the counter I was like you. I saw the CS go, and I was like, what the hell is that? And I went and looked at it, and I was like, wow, that's that's weird. And I, you know. All right. 
let's bring our policy guy back. Hey, Chris, what do you think about economies inside of games and where they're going to go? Well, it, it's an interesting area, right? You know, there's, you know, I was thinking of wild go, gold as you guys are talking about that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you know, everybody knows the model. If it takes me 12 hours of gameplay to get the damn sword, maybe I've paid somebody else 20 bucks to play those 12 hours. And, you know, it raised the issue of what is a product, a virtual product, you know, a, or a physical product. And it, it's funny that we're still having that debate, right? You know, um, you know, my kids, you know, three kids and two of them are, are rabid artists, right? And producing things all the time. And th but they're 30 years younger than me. And they're producing that and delivering it in ways that I'm not really familiar with. But is it any more real if it's print printed out or if it's virtual? So virtual currencies, you know, you, have, you get you can have a whole show on this one, I'm, I'm sure. So you have the virtual currencies. We now have cryptocurrencies. We have this whole you know long term you know uh, a debate about fiat currencies and so forth. Then physical and virtual items all at the same time. Blink blink. <laughs> Big blink blink. Yeah. Oh. oh my God. So true. So true. So true. This is fascinating. You've got multiple economies. You've got in-game economies and multiple games. You've got cryptocurrency. And, uh, we're not going to get started on cryptocurrency and legitimacy, but you've got cryptocurrency, NFTs, uh, washers. You've got all kinds of things. You've got uh, then regular economy, which is you know dollars and rubles and whatever the hell else currencies are out there. And there are intersections between all of them. And the economics of this is fascinating. I had a, I had a friend who was actually, he was a, a finance person, a professor, and he was actually arbitraging currencies between different games. So oh, he, yeah. was, he was buying currencies in one game and, and he was, you know, he would sell that in a different currency and use it to buy currencies in other games. And he was essentially doing options trading with gaming currencies Please. and he was using discrepancies between the rates on certain games in certain places and certain games in other places and the value of certain currencies in order to arbitrage that and make very small amounts of money on, on millions of microtransactions mm. between all these things. It was currency trading, but the currency was fiat and it was all... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's called arbitraging. And I mean, people, yeah, it's, I mean, it's not illegal and people do it with real currencies sure. all the oh, time sure. because if there's a slight, you know, there, there can be like a one one millionth of a cent discrepancy between the value you're, you're buying and selling Swiss francs for in London and the value you're buying and selling Swiss francs for in New York. And if somebody picks up on that and they make a, a transaction of $100 million, they can actually make a significant amount of money. And I know people who make their whole living and that's all they do all day is they just watch for those little... You know, I know people just sit there staring at the screen the way we sit there looking at packets and they're sitting there watching these exchange rates in different locations. And, mm -hmm. and you know, they have algorithms to try to tell them now's the time. And then you make a, you know, a million dollar buy and try to make a little bit of money. And they just do that all day long. Well, let's <laughs> let's be really clear how old these financial systems aren't right. You know, in this crowd, it's you know, good reference is Neil Stevenson's System of the World, you know, trilogy. Right. You know, go back uh -huh. 300 years and the very idea that finance, you know, is somehow decoupled from you know physical reality and then we you know within the last century you know the gold standard the idea that the united states is worth the the amount of uh, you know yellow metal that we hold at one time right it, it hopefully seems silly to people now the united states what would it cost to buy the united states that's that's the actual worth of the country and you know in our lifetimes in my lifetime i've seen all sorts of different uh you know trends in finance you know we had the 2008 you know, collapse because people were trying to theorize some, you know, some financial situations, but and everything we're, we're else we're talking about here. So this is all, this is all very much in flux over over yeah. a long period of time. It's very interesting to me. I mean, I, I, that's why I like that story so much because I was just, I, every time I see that, I'm just like, it's sort of like amazing to me how much money is going on. And then I immediately start thinking about all the illegal stuff I could do with that. Like, oh, wow, yeah. you <laughs> you could launder money here, couldn't you? Oh, <laughs> You, yeah, and, and like, and I also think about all the legal things like you do, like doing some of that arbitrage. Oh yeah, I mean, there's plenty of legal yeah. things you can do, yeah. and I was just like, how much of this stuff is legit, and and what could you get away with, and how well is it controlled, and makes me wish I wasn't so damn lazy. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So guys, actually, I want to do one quick thing that's a little offbeat, uh, and then I think maybe Larry wrap it, wrap it up. But. Um, so if you didn't hear and you didn't catch it on Twitter and you didn't see or hear from anybody screaming happiness, uh, Jeff Mann, one of our other hosts here on Security Weekly and the Security Weekly family, his granddaughter, Hannah, 
uh, who was, I think, only 14, I think. Jeff, don't mm-hmm. kill me if I'm wrong. Uh, she's now cancer free. His granddaughter. And that's that's awesome. Who's that? Yeehaw. Great. That's awesome. Great to hear. And, 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 and hope we and hope she and we hope she remains that way for the rest of her life. I hope so. her very long. Yeah. Oh, agree. Yeah. That's awesome. That so on a happy note, let's uh let's call it a night and let's wrap it up. So uh thank you, Doug, Josh, and Mr. Chris Blask for joining me this evening <coughs> and, and Lee. Fro- and Lee. We can't forget Lee, because you save the best for last. We were just confusing you with Josh because you have the same shirt. Yeah, because yeah, the same well. shirt. So thanks everybody. And Doug, oh, take us out. Over and out.